The uh, Simpson matter, Mr. Simpson is again present before the court with his counsel, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Douglas, people represented, Mr. Kelberg, Mr. Lynch, Mr. Darden, and Ms. Clark. Jury is not present. Counsel, anything we need to discuss before we invite the jurors to join us? Mr. Kelberg. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, to follow up on several matters that we briefly discussed last evening, first of all, and I just warn you, Mr. Shapiro, Dr. Lachman has had a chance to as well. The document or documents in the category, I should say, because there's not uh, evidence that we are aware of that any specific such document exists, but Mr. Hernandez, who is the uh, director at the medical uh, examiner's office, uh, had no independent recollection of seeing any such document, but he was at home when he was contacted last night. He is checking this morning, and he will contact us if he has them by about 9.30 or 10 o'clock, 10.30 break. Dr. Lakshmanan will call him because he was going to check through the records of which he is the custodian has them to see whether any such uh, type of document exists. All right. Second order of business is uh, we've been talking about other people's mistakes for about six or seven days. It's uh, appropriate, I think, for me to talk about one of my own with respect to Exhibit 363. The court will recall in that uh, short portion of the uh, Prime Time Live broadcast that there was left in the audio portion a statement made by Mr. Donaldson as he's uh, chasing after Dr. Golden about uh, an alleged gun incident. Undoubtedly, the court recalls that uh, the court was uh, the recipient of much paperwork and uh, heard much argument regarding the admissibility of any such incident. Uh, there was a motion in limine filed uh, by Mr. Lynch and myself to uh, exclude such evidence from cross-examination in the event Dr. Golden testified. The court issued its ruling, I have it here on April 7th of 1995, and uh, if nothing short of an abundance of caution, basically I'm asking the court to reinforce that that is its ruling uh, in spite of my error in uh, not verifying that that portion of the tape had been excluded or excised. I point out, first of all, that the court's ruling indicated that the remark only had relevance with respect to potential bias on the part of Dr. Golden. And I don't know if the court needs a copy of its ruling. I have a copy of the court here. But the court did not rule that it was admissible on the issue of Dr. Bolden's competency, but only as it may be relevant with respect to the issue of Dr. Bolden's potential bias against the defense. And the court went on to find under Section 352 that there were so many uncertainties with respect to the incident itself, uh, number one being whether it was directed to these defense counsel how the incident occurred and so forth as long no, as... I, I recollect, the, recollect the details of the argument. All right. That there's nothing about the incident which is relevant to Dr. Lakshmanan's testimony, which deals with Dr. Golden's competency, and about which there was a statement made by Dr. Lakshmanan in that interview regarding Dr. Golden's competency. So I would ask the court uh, to reaffirm that its ruling stands that my mistake has not in some fashion, quote, opened the door, unquote, to make what the court found to be inadmissible suddenly admissible. That's the first uh, aspect of my motion and limit I make this morning. The so second, what, let's assume that I agree with you that that should not have come in. What remedy are you direct, what direct remedy are you seeking? My remedy is I don't believe we can excise that statement from the disc and say, gee, it was never played before this jury. What my remedy would be is to provide a second copy of the exhibit, which has had excised from it that statement. And in the event the jury wishes to hear that exhibit 363, what they would hear would be the same exhibit, but with that one statement excised. I don't think that any um, reinforcement of that information needs to be paid at this point to the jury. Uh, it's obviously why I didn't make any effort to stop the tape and uh, raise any issue as to admonishment uh, regarding it as the tape was being played. So all I recommend as a uh, remedy would be to order our office to make a second uh, copy of the exhibit, but one which has excised that one statement and only that one statement, have it marked as exhibit 363A, and that will be the one that will be offered in evidence, I assume, by Ms. Clark and Mr. Darden uh, at the conclusion of the people's case when all of the evidence uh, Admissibility questions will be litigated. At least I assume that's what that will occur. So 
that's the remedy I suggest. Mr. Shapiro. Thank you very much, Your Honor. All right. Good morning, sir. Good morning. The court will recall that prior to the Sam Donaldson uh, interview being played, the court invited counsel to sidebar. And the court warned Mr. Kelberg that this may not be something that should be shown. And the court indicated that you would sustain our objection uh, to showing it. We indicated that we had no objection to showing it. And Mr. Kelberg indicated that although it was not his preference, he had been told by others in his office to show it. Second, the court rules were violated in that this tape was never previewed before Your Honor and myself before showing it, although I have seen it and I had no reason uh, not to have it shown because it does exactly what uh, the people have said throughout this trial. It talks about the truth, about really what happened in the coroner's office and what happens when uh, fine reporters investigate problems that for some reason the coroner does not want to investigate themselves. And even when pointed out, they don't want to investigate it. So this is no different than anything else that takes place in a trial. Uh, we are professionals. We are bound by rules of conduct. And on occasion, there are questions that come out that if you had your chance to edit them, you'd like to have them withdrawn and not have them considered. That's exactly what took place here. Further, I didn't want to press the issue uh, of bringing up the incident with Dr. Golden's gun. And after it was brought up, we didn't have any specific uh, information that it was directed towards any attorney. However, uh, following Your Honor's suggestion in the past, we did a Lexus search last night uh, regarding Dr. Golden. And we found an article August 12th in Newsday, uh, which uh, in summary says, as Dr. Golden left the uh, courthouse after being cross-examined by Robert Shapiro, Golden pounded the walls of the elevator and cursed Shapiro, murdering, m muttering, why did he have to ask me that question? Why did he have to ask me that question? And uh, then they go on to report the gun incident followed. Uh, there was a subsequent report that uh, the comments were actually not only directed towards lawyers for Mr. Simpson, but directly uh, towards me. And I will give the court and counsel uh, a copy from Lexus of that story from Newsday. So it is our strong feeling that uh, the people had this piece of tape. They elected to show it. After it was shown, it appeared to me that Ms. Clark directed Mr. Kelberg to the problem that was raised. And that's when it uh, became an issue. And the fact that there is no coordination or lack of coordination should not be held against Mr. Simpson. Here is the story from Newsday. Can I give this to Your Honor? Can we, can we, uh, uh, this is Robertson. Robertson. Make, Robertson. make a uh, copy for Thank both you. sides. All right, any other comment on that issue, Mr. Shapiro? No, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Mr. Kelber. Like respond, Your Honor. Your Honor, I uh, never uh, take exception to counsel employing hyperbole. And I certainly understand why the federal courts do not allow cameras in courtrooms to cut down on the hyperbole of counsel. But I take great honor when counsel misstate the facts. Let me state the facts as to that sidebar conversation. The facts were that the court wondered whether there was going to be an objection made to it. The court never indicated whether the court would sustain an objection or not because the court was unaware of the contents of that particular episode. The court's comment was, Mr. Kelberg, where are we going with this? I believe the court is absolutely correct in that, and I think the court will uh, acknowledge that I told the court 
the content of what I expected the program section to show. Mr. Shapiro was asked, in essence, by the court, as I recall it, if he had any objection. Mr. Shapiro indicated he had no objection. The court basically said, fine, and then we were going to proceed. Now, with respect to uh, some representation that I was given instructions on playing this, let me set the record very clear, Your Honor, if it hasn't been made clear already. When I am in court representing the prosecution with witnesses, nobody tells me what to do from my office. I am our lawyer in court. It is my judgment. It is my uh, theoretical considerations that go into the tactics that I entertain in presenting testimony. And I can guarantee Mr. Shapiro and I can guarantee this court that Ms. Clark had absolutely no input into any decision as to whether this would or would not be played. The decision was mine, mine alone, and I have no regrets whatsoever about doing it, and I have no doubt that the evidence would have been admissible had Mr. Shapiro, as his first area of cross-examination, gone into Dr. Lakshmanan's assessment of Dr. Golden's competency in performing these autopsies. This jury has a right to know that Dr. Lakshmanan made a comment that I believe he ruse having made to Sam Donaldson. And I must say, I believe this jury will see the kind of ambush tactics employed by Mr. Donaldson and find that if that represents sound journalistic practices, then there is a definite problem with the way the Fourth Estate practices its profession. Now, with respect to a conversation with Ms. Clark, let me point out my conversation with Ms. Clark was with respect to the limited amount of time we had left yesterday afternoon. And I indicated to Ms. Clark I had various alternative pieces of evidence which I could play. And because I don't know what her schedule is and whether she can stay till a quarter to six or not, I wanted her to know what was available. And she indicated that she would prefer that we play this incident. I said fine, because quite frankly, Your Honor, it's either yesterday afternoon or it's this morning, and to my way of thinking, it makes no difference whatsoever. I have a plan in my mind as to how the evidence will be presented, and as long as I present that evidence, to me, it makes no difference at all. So to accommodate Ms. Clark's uh, request, and in full agreement with her request, I played the tape at the time I did. I find it most interesting that in, in Mr. Shapiro, instead of posturing for the camera, would have focused on the argument I made to this court a moment ago, that he might have tried to respond to the issue. Is this relevant? to any issue regarding Dr. Lakshman. And the answer, I believe, has to be taken as a tacit acknowledgement by him that it's not, because the court found it was relevant, if at all, to bias. Now, Mr. Shapiro is relying upon a newspaper article, which, of course, is hearsay, reporting an alleged incident <coughs> with Dr. Golden I'm in not, the elevator. I'm not relitigating that aspect. All right. As far as... The only as issue is, what do we do with 363? So why don't you confine your comment to that, Gail? With 363, my suggestion is, as I indicated, Mr. Shapiro has offered no alternative suggestion. I merely indicated a belief that the portion should be excised to conform with the court's ruling, marked as 363A, and that would be admitted. But on the other hand, I'll tell you right now, Judge, the alternative remedy, keep it as is. They want to hear it, let them hear it. They send a question out, hey, do we have any evidence about some gun incident? The answer is going to be a big N-O, and you are not to infer or uh, speculate about any such evidence. Either way, it's fine with me. I don't care. But I came down here because I made a mistake. I wanted it brought to the attention of the court. I wanted the court to handle it in an appropriate manner, and that is the purpose behind that. So either alternative is fine with me, Judge. All right. Thank you, Counsel. There, there is a second aspect to the motion not as to the tape itself, but as to the two incidents, the Gay Phillips incident. Mr. Shapiro has indicated at the sidebar also last night that he believes evidence of the legal significance of Dr. Golden's mistakes are fuel for fodder or fodder for the cross-examination of Dr. Lakshmanan. As the court will recall, I asked Dr. Lakshmanan <laughs> whether or not there was any medical significance to Dr. Golden's mistakes dealing with entrance <coughs> exit wounds and dealing with the range of fire um, in the two cases. 
Dr. Lakshmanan indicated that they were significant mistakes, and he testified in his opinion why they were. The question is, what is the legal ramification that flows from each of those? The legal ramification is irrelevant to the issue of the medical significance because the whole thrust of this evidence goes to the significance or lack of significance of any mistakes Dr. Golden has made in the course of the autopsies he's performed. So let's, assume, let's assume that to be true, though. Isn't it fair game for the defense to then argue that, that point during closing arguments? Well, that given be, these medical mistakes, obviously they're going to have a legal consequence if they're believed by the trier of fact and if they, in fact, false or not may, true. It may well be a legitimate argument to suggest that many things can flow from medical mistakes of significance. And I would not find it inappropriate to argue in the abstract, keeping in mind there would be no evidence, because I'm indicating to the court my belief that such evidence is inadmissible as irrelevant, 352, calling for speculation outside the expertise of this witness mm -hmm. and a number of well, other grounds. Well, Mr. Kelberg, I'm not inclined to enter entertain much more of this argument at, at this point. It's premature. You haven't finished your presentation. I don't have an indication that the defense is going to offer that. All right. I just want to alert the court then, uh, because I would ask for a ruling in the event Mr. Shapiro intends to go into that area on cross-examination of Dr. Lachman. All right. And I have nothing further than your honor. All right. Thank you. All right, the uh, prosecution is ordered to prepare an alternative exhibit uh, 363. It will be designated 363A. It is to include the entirety of what was played yesterday with the exception of the comment regarding the gun incident. Court still finds that subject to 352. All right, let's have the jurors. video VHS of 363 and 363A, since we won't be able to provide the jury with a laser disc player. So you want just the VHS? Just VHS. And you want to make the 363 VHS as A and the 363 modified? No. 363 will substitute a video tape for the laser disc as 363. unless you want to donate to the court a laser disc. All right. <clears throat> Gentlemen, please be seated. Doctor. All right, let the record reflect that we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Dr. Lachmanen is on the witness stand again. And Mr. Kelberg, is that uh, some of your material there? All right, good morning again, doctor. Sir, you were reminded you are still under oath. And Mr. Kelberg, you may conclude your direct examination. I have every expectation of doing so, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, I have a series of documents. I mark them uh, by pen, but for the record, may I mark them? Yes. These uh, deal with chain of custody documents. Um, as 364A, an autopsy evidence collection log dated June 14, 1994. As 364B, an evidence log for the Goldman Ron autopsy as 364C, an evidence log for the Simpson-Nicole autopsy, as 364D, a document entitled Drop Box Log, as 364E, 
a document which um, talks about cassettes prepared in the laboratory by DME and contains many other entries as 364F, a one-page document with the handwritten entry at the top, toxicology log, as 364G, a similar appearing document, but this time with more writing in the middle and with the date of May 10th that appeared in the upper left-hand corner of the page uh, excluded, as 364H, a um, seal concerning blood obtained before embalming in the Goldman autopsy, and as 364I, a similar document for the Nicole Brown Simpson autopsy. All right, they'll be so marked. And, Your Honor, I have uh, blow-ups, which counsel, I believe, will stipulate are accurate blow-ups. Mr. Shapiro? I'm sorry. We Certainly. Mr. Shapiro? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, maybe Certainly. All right. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Uh, Kelberg, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. And Mr. Fairlow is going to be helping me out uh, with the ELMO. But first, Doctor, let me show you these documents that I've just marked as Exhibits 364A through I. Doctor, in general terms, are you familiar with each of those documents? Yes, I am. In general terms, please describe what each of those documents is. Uh, 364A <clears throat> is the autopsy evidence collection log. This is the log to reflect the, uh, which specimens were collected during autopsy. And that is reflected uh, on the current cases being discussed. And then this log is, uh, when the specimens are received in the toxicology lab, it is uh, uh, marked off by the person receiving the specimens in the lab, saying they received the specimen, they put their initials, and then a, 
they keep a copy and a copy is sent back to the autopsy area. Doctor, is that document a true and correct copy of the particular autopsy evidence log from the two cases of Ronald Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes. Are the entries which are made on that document entries made by employees of the coroner's office acting in their official duties as such employees? Yes. Are the entries which they make entries which are made at or near the time of the events which are recorded in that document? Yes. Perhaps instead of going forward to the next one, could Mr. Ferretlow put that document up on the Elmo and let me show you the blow up in. Uh, I'm not sure we have got a stipulation yet on the record. Mr. Shapiro, will you stipulate that we have blow ups that correspond identically except for size to the documents which have been marked as 364A through R? Thank you, Council. Simpson autopsies. Yes, uh, this is the autopsy evidence collection log. The date of, uh, the, of this log was June 14th, 1994. You have 5135 is the coroner's case number, belonged to Mr. the number given to Mr. Ron Goldman. Goldman is a medical examiner. This is the for verifying forensic technician. Keep, keep your verifying mind. forensic technician was George McDowell. George who, Dr. McDowell. Can you spell his name? M-C-D-O-W-E-L-L. -L. And what is he uh, supposed to do by initialing that document? That is, he checked that these specimens were collected during the autopsy. Uh, the specimens collected on Mr. Goldman were blood, stomach contents, bile, uh, a histo jar, that is the storage jar with the tissues and formalin, and typing blood. And these initials are J-M, which is the uh, uh, Mr. Murillo, who is the uh, technician in the toxicology lab. When this log comes up, he initials saying that he received it and uh, uh, checks off that. Can you spell Mr. Murillo's last name? M-U-R-I-L-L-O. -L -L uh, so that belongs to Mr. Goldman's autopsy. Uh, unfortunately, due to, the, due to the copying, this is a little bit dark here. This is 5136 here, Dr. Golden, and this belongs to Ms. Nicole Brown. Simpson's specimen collection. They collected blood, urine, the storage jar, which contains the tissues, and the typing blood. Uh, and again, the same initials, Mr. Uh, indicating Mr. Murillo received it in the toxicology lab. Doctor, is a document of this nature prepared for each day of the year uh, concerning all autopsies performed at your offices? Yes, this is the initial chain of custody of specimen collection at the autopsy room, and then uh, I gave you the next stage, which is the toxicology lab, wherein a person receives it and signs off on it. So you've got a chain of custody from the autopsy room to the uh, 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 toxicology lab. And I already uh, discussed the form 15, which is the initial log saying the doctor did collect it. He initials the 15. So uh, that so far, we have got the chain of custody for these specimens. All right, Doctor, why don't you, if you wouldn't mind, please just stay where you are. And by the way, Your Honor, I've marked these big boards correspondingly to the small paper exhibits, but adding an extra letter. So if this one is 364AA to correspond to the blow up of 364A. Thank you. Doctor, let me put up now the blow up that has been marked as 364BB. In general terms, what kind of document is this one? This is the, uh, master, this is the master evidence log uh, for the, uh, which uh, records the collection of any physical evidence, hair samples, uh, uh, typing blood, etc. for the department. Usually the investigator initiates this when the uh, evidence collection starts. This particular uh, exhibit uh, uh, refers to Mr. Ron Goldman's evidence log maintained by the Department of Coroner. Uh, as you can see, the coroner's number is here, 5135. Uh, and uh, 
Is there an individualized evidence log kept for each case handled by the coroner's office? Yes, it is. And uh, what this card will reflect is the when a particular piece of evidence was uh, obtained, uh, the date, the person obtaining it, how long it was in our custody, and also if it was released, the date of release, and the person who obtained that specimen from us will be recorded also. Are the entries which are made on this document made by employees of the coroner's office? Yes. In the course of their official responsibilities with the office? Yes. Do the entries reflect events that occurred at or near the time of the entries? Yes. Now, doctor, can you take us through the specifics of what this document shows? Uh, yes, I already mentioned that this particular exhibit belongs to the evidence log of Mr. Ron Goldman. Uh, we'll start with uh, the typing blood swatch. Keep your voice up. Typing blood swatch. Uh, this refers to a swatch which is made on every uh, case where typing blood is obtained. Uh, it was done by Mr. Adrian Dersidan, D-E-R-S-I-D-A-N and it was made on June 15th uh, at 8 o'clock. Uh, Mr. Dersedan is an employee of the coroner's office? Yes. And it was received in the evidence room by uh, Mr. Sigler, Mr. Sigler, who is our uh, foreign, uh, senior criminalist who is also in charge of uh, the evidence area of our office. And it was uh, released to Mr. Phil Van Natter of LAPD. Robbery homicide by Mr. Siglar on June 15th at 8:45. The uh, next entry, doctor. Uh, the uh, next entry. Uh, this is for the typing blood, which was which I discussed so far. This just indicates that the swatch was made. I'm sorry. The release material is what? The typing blood. Is that in some kind of container or? It's in a, a test tube. The tube. So that tube with whatever blood was in it was released to Mr. Van Adam? Yes. All right, the next entry then. Then we have the hair kit. Uh, I discussed this, uh, I think, on Tuesday last week. Ms. Claudine Ratliff obtained the hair samples from Mr. Ron Goldman, put it in the uh, drop-off box, which I mentioned, and on uh, June 13th uh, in the afternoon at 1440. Doctor, is that that mailbox-like device? Yes. All right. Then Mr. Patino uh, retrieved it from our drop-off box in the evidence and took it to the evidence room on June 15, 94 at 7 o'clock. And as we discussed earlier, Mr. Grandis of LAPD SID retrieved it from our department from Mr. Patino on June 24th at 9.30. Uh, next entry, doctor. Next entry is the clothing. Uh, the clothing as you recall, Mr. Goldman had shirt, pants, shoes, and socks. As I discussed earlier on June 13th, I mean, sorry, June 14th, the photographs were taken. During that time, the clothing was removed. And I rem if you recall, it was Mr. John Marsden who was our autopsy technician, forensic photographic technician who took the clothing off. It was done on June 14th at 8.40. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this clothing is dried. And when it was completely dry, Mr. Petino retrieved it kept it in the uh, evidence room on June 20th, 94, and Mr. Grandis uh, took custody of the clothing from our office, from Mr. Petino, and Mr. Grandis <coughs> works for LAPD SID, and that was done on June 24th at uh, 9.20 in the morning. Uh, and, of course, this just refers to this uh, asterisk here, that only the whole blood was, um, uh, the, uh, the blood was released to Mr. Van Adam. For the record, you're referring to that initial uh, entry under typing blood. Yes. Re referring to the whole blood in the tube that you yes. already described. Yes. Then the typing blood swatch, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was made by uh, Mr. Dersedarian on June 15th. Uh, Mr. Sigler got custody of it, of the swatch, uh, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon uh, because it has to dry. And then that was released to Mr. Grandis of LAPD SID on June 24th at 9.20. Uh, the fingerprint card, palm print cards, as you recall, the fingerprints and palm prints were obtained by Mr. Jacobo of our office. Uh, it was obtained on June 13th, the day the uh, remains were brought to our office. Uh, Mr. Patino received those cards on June 15th in the evidence area, and it was released to one Mr. Dubay of LIPD 
uh, LA, I'm sorry, LAPD by Mr. Patino on June 16th, uh, uh, 1994 at 845. Uh, the liver temperature thermometer, which was used to obtain the liver temperature on both the dissidents, uh, was kept in our custody on June 22nd by Mr. Mahaney. He calibrated the instrument of that day. And Mr. Sigler has it is in custody uh, as since February. It has not been released. It's still in our custody. That's the thermometer which was used to obtain the temperature. Anything further about this document? Doctor? No. All right, let me put up what I'll ask to be marked as our 364-C, a blow-up of the small document. And it appears to be a similar one to 364-DC, except it appears to refer to Nicole Brown Simpson instead of Mr. Bolton. Would you take us, first of all, let me ask you, in general terms, is this the same kind of document as the previous exhibit, 364-DB? Yes. And would your answers be the same with respect to the manner in which this document is created and retained by the coroner's office? Yes. Uh, the investigator starts the document, and then it's kept in the evidence room of the coroner's office. And the entries, again, are all made by employees of the coroner's office in their duties as employees? Yes. At or near the time of the events recorded? Yes. Take us through what uh, this document shows. Please. Again, we'll start. Again, this belongs to Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson. Typing blood uh, was uh, uh, received in the lab in the evidence room on 15th. Uh, actually, it was collected. Both the typing bloods were collected by Dr. Golden at autopsy, and in the evidence room, Mr. Siegler signs off on it, released to Mr. Van Natter the same day uh, of LAPD at uh, 8.45 in the morning. Uh, the fingernail kit uh, was uh, processed by Mr. Ratcliffe on June 13th at 13.40 hours, received in the evidence room by Mr. Patino from the drop box on June 15th released to Mr. Grandis June 24th at 9.30. Mr. Grandis of LAPD. Uh, hair kit, Claudine Ratcliffe uh, obtained it on June 13th, 13.40. Patino receives it in the evidence room from the drop-off box on June 15th. And this specimen was also released to LAPD on June 24th. Uh, as you recall, the clothing worn by Ms. Simpson was a dress and a panty uh, recovered by our photographer John Marsden at 7 o'clock on June 14th during the autopsy photographic process. Uh, the dry clothing was recovered by Mr. Spettino on June 16th, released to the same Mr. Grandis of LAPD on June 24th. Uh, the liver thermometer already addressed this. Uh, one thermometer was used and uh, it's in our custody. The blood scrapings, as you recall, was obtained by our criminalist from the right thigh and right calf of Ms. Uh, Nicole Brown Simpson. This took place on June 13th, uh, and they were placed in evidence uh, and retrieved from the box by Mr. Patino on the 15th and released again to the same LAPD uh, person, Mr. Grandis, on June 24th. The finger, the finger and palm prints obtained by Jacobo on June 13th when the bodies came in. Patino go, retrieved it in the evidence room on June 15th, released to Mr. Dubé on June 16th at 8.45. The typing blood swatch made by, made by Mr. Adrian Desiderian on uh, June 15th, uh, received by Mr. Sigla at the same time, released to Mr. Grandis on June 24th of 1994 by Mr. Patino. Just to clarify, I think you said that received by Mr. Sigler the same time regarding the typing blood swatches. I mean, in the afternoon, in the afternoon. The same date, but a different time. Yes. Anything further about this document? Doctor? No. <coughs> All right, let me show you then.
Mr. Fairlow, is that going to affect the uh, Elmo? Is that too high? I'm sorry, move it forward? No, move it forward or lower it. Doctor, in general terms, are you familiar with this document? Yes, this is the drop-off log sheet, which is kept to the next to the mailbox, which we discussed uh, last Tuesday. The purpose of this document, in general terms, is to record uh, who dropped off what evidence in the drop-off log. Uh, I mean, the drop-off box, and to record it. Are the entries that are made on this document entries made by employees of the coroner's office? Yes. Is the document kept in the course of the official duties of the coroner's office? Yes. Are the events recorded on this document by the coroner employees ones which reflect acts occurring at or about the time of the events recorded? Yes. Take us through this document as it pertains to these two autopsies. Yes. Uh, we'll start. 5135 belongs to Mr. Ron Goldman, and this refers to uh, Mr. Ms. Ratcliffe dropping off the hair kit, uh, which was collected on Mr. Ron Goldman. And you can see her initials here on 5136, which is a case number for Ms. Brown Simpson. Uh, a fingernail kit was processed, a hair kit was processed, but we also collected some physical evidence of the blood st uh, stains, scrapings taken by Mr. Mahaney. And all these samples were dropped off by Ms. Uh, Radcliffe. Uh, she also indicated that she had placed the evidence log card because, you know, they generate, they, they, they uh, uh, start the evidence log sheet. So that was also made available. Doctor, before you go further, I just want to be sure. Is that a reference to, for example, I don't know if I've got the one for Goldman or the one for Brown Simpson, but is that the document you're referring to? In yes. Time? See, Ms. Radcliffe starts off the document, and that's, uh, uh, that's what is recorded there. All right, that was the log as to Mr. Uh, Goldman. And it's 364BB. Thank you, Your Honor. Let me just outline this area. Okay, you've just been discussing, Doctor. I gather this document is used for a number of different cases. Yes. It's just a drop off box and a log to show what specimens or uh, evidence was dropped off. And then, uh, if you go lower down on the same sheet, uh, 5136 and 5135. 5136 belongs to Ms. Uh, Simpson and uh, 5135 to Mr. Ron Goldman. Keep your voice up, uh, doctor. This reflects the drop off of the fingerprint and palm print cards. Uh, the prints were taken by Mr. Jacobo, but the drop off log indicates that it was dropped off by one Mr. Mitten, M E T T I N. Was Mr. Mitten an employee of your office at the time? Yes. He was a volunteer. A volunteer meaning what, doctor? People who volunteer to work for our office. And when they volunteer to work for your office, uh, are they considered employees in the sense that they have responsibilities as if they were being paid employees to do certain things that are the responsibilities of the coroner's office? Yes, and they work under the supervision of the staff supervising them. Let me outline this area that you've now been describing. I'll do that in red also. Is there anything else about this particular document that pertains to these two cases? No. Uh, I have another board that I'd ask for the record to be marked 364 double E. blow up of the uh, smaller document. Doctor, what kind of document is this? Uh, this reflects the uh, 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 histopathology uh, evidence log, uh, wherein uh, uh, the tissue jar, which is uh, uh, generated at the autopsy, containing the specimens from the autopsies, they are received in the uh, histopathology area, which is a separate section of the laboratory division, and uh, a chain of custody is maintained for the histopathology specimens. And basically, uh, you have a reflection of how many jars there were, uh, 
whether any microscopic sections were submitted, the date they were submitted, any <coughs> duplicates were made, etc. Could you keep your voice up, please, Doctor? Uh, the jar, the whole jar was received on Ms., uh, Mr. Goldman, five hundred, the number is here, the coroner's case number, uh, on June uh, uh, 14th, the name of the DME is here. Uh, one jar was received on Goldman and Ms. Uh, Simpson each. And uh, on Ms. Simpson, uh, 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 a microscopic section was cut. Doctor, uh, what is that uh, category that's uh, described at the top? Cassettes prepared in the laboratory by DME. What does that category refer to? That refers to when you, sub when you take a microscopic section, you take a piece of tissue and put it in what's called a cassette, which is then submitted. And that is taken to a, a processing laboratory where it goes through a process wherein the tissue is made into what's called a paraffin block. Uh, wherein a histopathology technician can take sections of that tissue, uh, thin sections, so that tissue can be studied under the microscope. And uh, this process is what is done in the histopathology laboratory. And a cassette is uh, uh, this particular uh, column refers to if microscopic sections were, were done and on Ms. Brown Simpson, but not on Mr. Goldman at that time. Uh, one uh, section of the brain was submitted on July 1st. I discussed it briefly during my testimony. And uh, uh, then the slides were available on July 12th and returned uh, August 2nd back to the lab. And uh, this refers to the same slide which, uh, which came to me. Uh, Doctor, please keep your voice up. I'm wondering about this date. Uh, uh, this says 2194 should be 95 in f February this year, I think, uh, when uh, we wanted to make duplicates for the defense to send it to the, uh, uh, in February this year to Albany, we made some duplicate slides of the brain slide, and that's reflected on the 28th here. Two slides were made. And originally, I sent the original slide to Albany, and it came back. And when I got the duplicates, I mailed it to Dr. Barton. So that's what is reflected here. And this log is not, uh, this is a copy of a log which is not really up to date, because in May of this year, we cut additional sections at the request of the defense on both the cases. A total of 16 cassettes were cut, nine on Ms. Uh, Brown Simpson, if I recall, and seven on Mr. Goldman. And, uh, the current log in our office should reflect that uh, having taken place. So what I'm saying is this log is a permanent log in the coroner's office. Any additions or entries which are made at a later date, few years later, will be maintained in the same log sheet so that there's a chain of custody of what sections were taken at what time uh, as long as we have custody of the specimens. Doctor, have you examined all of the slides that have been prepared uh, in this case, including the most recent uh, series of slides? Yes, I have. And that was part of your preparation before testifying? Yes. Anything else about this document, Doctor? No. Let me just outline, again in red, the areas that refer to the two cases before the court and jury. Just Anything else, Doctor? You want to add something? Yes. Uh, in Ms. Uh, Nicole Brown Simpson. Sustain phrase question. Doctor, uh, have we not covered some aspect of the chart uh, to this point? Yes. What aspect have we not covered? Well, an entry which has not yet been made in this particular copy of the log. Uh, when Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson's jar was originally examined by the defense pathologist and myself on June 22nd, the uh, spine specimen and the laryngeal specimen with the same jar. Voice we're in the same jar, but now we have made an additional jar to keep the specimen because we did some additional examinations. As you recall, during my testimony on Ms. Simpson, we had evaluation by our criminalist uh, on, our, on the laryngeal specimen and spine specimen. And you, as you recall, we also did x-rays on the spine specimen. So when we retrieved it, we put it in a separate jar. So we have two jars on Ms. Simpson and one on Mr. Goldman. I just wanted to reflect that also. And that will complete this chart.
Honor, for the record, I'd ask that this first page of this uh, blow-up series with the toxicology log handwritten entry be marked as 364 double F yeah. to, cor to correspond with the uh, paper document. Mr. Fairlow, is that going to interfere? Doctor, in general terms, can you tell us what this document is? This is the internal uh, toxicology specimen log. As you recall, you saw the autopsy specimen log sheet wherein uh, the log comes up, the toxicology technician uh, signs off that he received the specimen, but that log sheet goes back to the autopsy area. He just keeps a copy. So a new log is uh, maintained in the toxicology lab, and this is the internal toxicology log uh, with reference to the specimens on each coroner's case, and this particular document refers to the, uh, uh, both our cases, 5135 is Ron Goldman. Uh, we received a blood sample. Uh, we, they also received stomach and bile. All right, you've got some uh, letters that you've just been pointing to. Uh, can you tell us what those letters refer to? June 15th, ST means stomach and B means bile. Is that a common designation used by personnel in your office to refer, such th to, refer to such things? Yes, and it is the same Mr. Joe Murillo, M-U-R-I-L-L-O, who received it uh, in the lab. And 5136 is the blood specimen on Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson, plus we got urine sample received. U stands for urine. And of course, the uh, don't worry about the date here. This is, we use old books so that we don't, uh, I mean, we use the same books, but the dates are the different. I was going to ask you, this document has up in the left-hand corner the date May 10th. Is that the date that refers to the entries that appear on this document? No, no, no. The, the date is the correct date here. I just said that we use an older uh, uh, book uh, because it's, we have some books available, so we just use it. But the key thing is the date of entry for each specimen. And these numbers that appear to be stamped in vertically, starting with 005127, I believe, in the upper left-hand corner, um, what do they refer to, Doctor? They are the different uh, cases uh, which have specimens for that day because, you know, in the coroner's office, our case assignments go from the number one for each year till the end of the year. So this particular day on June 14th and 15th, all those case numbers uh, are the ones which were processed in our office. Is this document prepared in advance with respect to those pre-stamped numbers? Yes, to a, a certain extent it is. but. The entries are all made as the specimens are received. And are the entries then made by employees of the coroner's office in the course of their official responsibility? Yes. And are the entries to reflect acts or events which occurred at or about the time of the entries which are made? Yes. Anything else regarding this document, Doctor? No. Let me outline, if I could, please, in red, the areas that you were just identifying. Is that an accurate uh, circling of the area you've just been describing, Doctor? Yes. Let me flip on this chart. And, Your Honor, I ask if this uh, blow up be marked 364 double G to correspond with the paper document. Yes. Doctor, what is this document we're looking at? It is the same document, only thing is there are more entries made here with reference to the. Uh, what happened to these samples, as you recall, this February of this year, I think February 17th or 18th of this year, the defense wanted specimens sent to Albany. And I was in Seattle, and we coordinated the release of those specimens. Basically, uh, I think uh, a sample of blood sample from each blood bottle was sent to, C uh, to Albany. And also, I sent st stomach contents on Mr. Goldman, which was available for the defense pathologist to examine. So. In that particular day, I communicated with uh, the DA's office, uh, who in turn communicated with the defense attorneys. We communicated with, I communicated directly with Mr. Ba Dr. Barden. And uh, uh, we arrived at what specimens they needed. And this, all these entries reflect the removal of the specimens from the lab, transmission to Albany, and then back, and when they were received. So a chain of custody is maintained at all times of any specimen in the coroner's office. And uh, it shows that we have a very chain of custody in our office. 
please take us through that chain of custody as reflected by the entries here, Doc. Uh, as you can recall, this part I've already discussed, and uh, uh, this f 5 ml of blood and stomach contents on Mr. Goldman, 5 ml of blood on Ms. Uh, Simpson. Doctor, what does the word aliquot mean? Aliquot means a small amount of blood in a container. Just a sample? Yes. We didn't give the whole sample because that was agreed on by Ms. Dr. Barden and myself, uh, what they needed. Uh, and then it was released by Mr. Gary Siegler to Brian Hale of L.A. County District Attorney's Office on February 17th at 4.45. And it was returned to the tox lab login room by our chief of laboratories, Joe Muto, on February 21st, 1995 at 1500. That is, the stomach contents was returned. The blood sample we sent, they retained. And uh, 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 then... Uh, we also put an indefinite hold on all the specimens we have on this particular two cases. Uh, Is that indicated in this document? Yes, it says hold. And this hold has been there since July of last year. Does that terminology have a special meaning in the coroner's office? Yes, it does. Because, you know, uh, we do 6,000 autopsies and 3,000 examinations a year. So we have retention times for every specimen collected. We can't retain them indefinitely. But if in a particular case a request is made for a hold, uh, then we retain it. And uh, that's what it reflects. So otherwise, these specimens get uh, discarded uh, on the retention time schedule maintained by the coroner's office. And is that complete uh, a discussion of the entries that have been added on this document, 364 double G, to refer to the uh, chain of events for the release and subsequent return of some? but not all of the material sent to Dr. Bodden in Albany? Yes. Anything further about this document? No. Again, Doctor, any of the additional entries, would they, these be docu uh, I'm sorry, entries made by employees of the coroner's office in the course of their official duties? Yes. And made at or about the time of the events which are reported in the document? Yes. Let me flip the page. Doctor, uh, and I'd ask your honor the record reflect uh, a designation of 364 H for a blow up of the uh, single page document. Yes. Doctor, in general terms, are you familiar with this document? Yes, I am. What is this one? This is a label which is uh, on every blood bottle uh, where blood sample is obtained from a particular dissident. Uh, it's got two layers. One layer is left on the bottle. The outer layer is uh, uh, taken off in the toxicology lab. And this is the copy of the label of the blood bottle, which was uh, on Mr. Ron Goldman, 5135, coroner's case number. There and is a, I'm sorry, there and is a yes, there's a stamp here, the pre address stamp. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, and the number is again handwritten here. and. Uh, it also says here, I mean, first let's start here. The autopsy was uh, done on June 14th. Uh, the sample was obtained at 11.30 uh, by Dr. Golden. He initials off the bottle here that he took the blood sample. Uh, and that's the way we know that he has seen that the sample belongs to that particular person. And as you recall, this blood sample was, uh, the label was removed by uh, Mr. Joe Murillo of our toxicology lab as part of maintaining the uh, evidence uh, on this particular case. Anything further about this document, Doctor? No. All entries made by coroner employees? Yes. At or about the time of the events recorded? Yes. In the course of their responsibilities as employees of the coroner's office? Yes. Let me flip or try to flip. To a document, Your Honor, it asks to bear the designation 364 double I. Yes. And again, just a blow up of the smaller single page document. Doctor, uh, this appears to be a similar kind of form to the one you were just talking about. Is that an accurate assessment? Yes. What is the difference, if any, between this form and the one we were just looking at, double H? This belongs to Ms. Uh, Nicole uh, Brown Simpson, 
5136. This is a pre-stamped imprint card uh, information. Handwritten case number again here. Uh, blood sample is obtained by Dr. Golden, June 14th, 9.30 in the morning. Mr. Murillo received the blood sample on June 15th, and Dr. Golden has initially, it's upside down, but IG here, June 14th. So that authenticates that he took the blood sample of this particular person on that particular day. Doctor, again, all entries made by employees of the coroner's office in the course of their official responsibilities? Yes. And to reflect acts or events that occurred at or about the time of the entries? Yes. Anything further about this document? No. That does it for this argument. You take the stand, Doctor. All right, it's noted, overruled. Under, uh, motion, motion yep, under 1280 of the Evans Code. Thank you, Council. <laughs> Following the uh, meeting on June 22nd, 1994, with Drs. Baden and Wolf, was a document prepared by Mr. Sigler in your office? Yes. What was the uh, purpose of that particular document? Uh, I, I don't know which particular document you're referring to because we. We made some minutes during the meeting. I had some handwritten notes, and Sigler had some handwritten notes, and uh, it was later transcribed. Uh, I, I kept a copy of the transcript copy for both prosecution and defense. Let me find the document uh, again, Your Honor, with the court's permission. what appears to be a three-page document along with a one-page handwritten Form 42. The document uh, is dated July 28, 1994. It appears to be a letter from Mr. Sigler to Mr. Hodgman of our office. May it be marked collectively as Exhibit 365. 365. Doctor, let me show you this series of documents. I'll take the other exhibits away. Are you familiar with this letter and the one-page Form 42 notes? Yes. In general, Doctor, what is this letter, this July 28th letter from Mr. Siglar to Mr. Hodgman? This is a letter sent by Mr. Sigler to Mr. Hodgman uh, uh, based on his request regarding our weekly meeting of the DMEs on June 23rd. Uh, this letter was sent out when I was not in, I had not seen the letter before it was sent out, but I have a copy of it uh, because I was on vacation at that time. Uh, it reflects to information which was discussed in a DME meeting uh, which we had in our office uh, on June 23rd of 94. Uh, and uh, do you want me to go into the contents of the letter or? Yes, in general first, and then we'll put it up on the Elmo so the ladies and gentlemen of the jury will have an opportunity to read it. Uh, they discussed the different issues pertaining to the two cases which are being discussed in trial. Uh, and you're going to put it up in the Elmo so we can discuss each item as we go through, uh, as you put it up on the Elmo. Uh, but what happened was after the DME meeting on June 26th, uh, 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 they also discussed it in a meeting of the forensic technicians. And these are internal uh, department meetings. But uh, I think somehow the, uh, the information went to the press and then uh, we were asked about these, uh, this information. And that's how the district attorney's office wanted to have information. Uh, input on this information, and that's how this letter came about. Doctor, would it be accurate as a summary that the information pertains to 
possible mistakes or errors in the coroner's office that relate to these two cases? Yes. And that the Sustain. Who phrased the question? All right. Why don't I just put it up on the Elmo? All right. This will be People's 365. It is, Your Honor. All right. And let me start with page one. Oh, why don't we just start at the top, uh, Mr. Fairlow, and focus it in so the ladies and gentlemen of the jury will have an opportunity to read it. And, Your Honor, I'd ask that the, the jurors have an opportunity to read the letter, and uh, Mr. Fairlow can move it uh, at any time appropriate from the court's perspective down so all paragraphs of each page can be read. All right, 984, can you read that? Thank you. All right, let's move the letter. All right, Mr. Fairlow, please. Right. Inquire before I move to page two, then, Your Honor. Yes. Doctor, this uh, summary listing on this page six items, starting with item number one, what does that refer to? Uh, as you recall, on Tuesday, uh, I last week, I showed you where the uh, homicide uh, cases are normally stored. That is in that uh, crypt area where they were uh, uh, different uh, uh, levels where the gurneys could be placed. I also showed you on Tuesday uh, a separate area in the coroner's office, the third autopsy room with closed, uh, uh, where there are locked doors available. Uh, basically, this refers to that uh, uh, placing certain types of cases where there's a lot of interest uh, to place them in a more secure area in a locked crypt. That's what he's trying to refer to here. Was there any security for the bodies of these two decedents? All bodies are in full security because they are in the coroner's office in the cold crypt area. And nobody can enter it unless you're a coroner's employee. And uh, uh, what is meant here is <coughs> little more security locking the bodies in a secure area. That's what that means. It doesn't mean that the bodies are not secure. Every body in the coroner's office is secure in the cold crypt area, which I already showed. Uh, the, uh, all of you on Tuesday last week. If you want, you can show the photographs again. We can explain this a little better. I think uh, we can recall that particular location. <coughs> I'd rather try and get through this list of items if we could, Doctor. Item number two, what does that refer to? Uh, preventing uninvolved employees from observing dissidents should have occurred. Uh, again, this is a personal opinion expressed, I think. Uh, you have to keep your voice it's up. It's a personal that. opinion expressed. Uh, 
basically in the corners office we have visitors i mean volunteers we have sometimes uh, people coming to watch autopsies especially medical students and other path pathology staff and uh, what is meant by this is uh, uh, if you keep the dissident secure uh, only the person who's responsible for the particular case will be able to visualize the, uh, I mean, to view the, not visualize, view, view the remains uh, because they are the only persons who need to be involved with the particular case. Uh, this is what is meant by, by, by this sentence. Doctor, were any personnel not directly involved in the autopsies in that location of uh, number six, that table number six where you testified the autopsies were performed during the course of those two autopsies? My recollection is the detectives were there. As I told you, I went there twice briefly. I was not there all the time. Uh, uh, the detectives were there and Dr. Golden was there. And of course, you see, we have six autopsy stations there. And uh, autopsies are going on in every station. So you have pathologists there, our forensic technicians. And if some of them are homicides, you're going to have the detectives of those uh, uh, divisions there. If it's an in-custody death, you're going to have DA personnel there. Depends on the situation. I can't tell you who were there in their autopsy room. But all persons, to my knowledge, who should be there are the persons who are working on a particular case or have to be there for some reason. And the other personnel who, uh, who could be in the corridors would be the cleaning personnel, if at all there were any there that day. I don't know. How about item number three? We've already talked about uh, the fact that the stomach contents of Nicole Brown Simpson were not saved and you've testified as to the reason why you asked Dr. Golden to save the stomach contents of Mr. Goldman. Beyond what you've already testified to, is there anything else that concerns item number three? Nothing. It's a factual statement. We didn't save Nicole's stomach contents. Is item number four something you've also testified about uh, when we were looking at the Form 15 on uh, the autopsy forms for Mr. Goldman? Yes, uh, that is just uh, uh, that. He collected the bile, everything is recorded properly, but only thing is on the bottle, the urine uh, box was marked and not bile. Item number five, I believe we had testimony when we were doing the photographs of the <coughs> coroner's office. We also looked at photographs of various uh, kits, including the fingernail kits for, or kit for Nicole Brown Simpson. Uh, is there anything beyond what you've already testified to that concerns item number five? No. What about item number six? Item number six is, uh, uh, refers to when the clothing is dried, the correct procedure is to place each item of clothing in a separate brown paper, uh, wrap, to wrap them separately. Uh, on June 22nd, when Dr. Barden uh, was there to see the evidence specimens, we found that Nicole Brown Simpson's panty and uh, dress had been wrapped in the same envelope, and that's what this refers to. And what, if any, significance from a forensic pathologist standpoint is there regarding having the panties and the dress wrapped together? Well, uh, it's the same person's uh, clothing, uh, and as you recall the scene photographs, the dress was overlying the panty when, if at all, if there was any blood staining there, it was already in contact. Uh, it's not a correct procedure, so that is a, a mistake. But as far as the significance in this particular case, I don't think it has much significance because the clothing was put together only after it was dry, and uh, it's happened, it's, uh, and it's recorded. The motion is great, last portion of the answer was non-responsive. <coughs> yes. The jury is to disregard the last comment regarding the significance of this. Proceed. That was non-responsive to the question. Doctor, have you evaluated as part of your preparation before testifying the significance, if any, of putting those two pieces of clothing together? Yes. What is the significance, if any, for having done that? Uh, oh. Overruled. You may answer the question, Doctor. All I, I said already they were placed together and the clothing was already dry. Uh, what I'm trying to say is this. I don't see anything 
knew would have occurred if, even if they had been placed together, that any new evidence would have been transferred from each other because they belong to the same person. That's what I meant. Anything else about item six? No. Could we have Mr. Ferret will then put the first portion of page uh, two of this exhibit on 365? Yes. Oh, I think Mr. Farrellow would uh, be benefited by having page two. Well, uh, uh, it's self-explanatory. Apparently, a reporter was in our uh, lunchroom without our knowledge, and uh, that's, some, that's, that's an indication for the security for the uh, building, and uh, that again states a fact which apparently happened. Doctor, where is the lunchroom? First of all, is your building a building of more than one floor? We have uh, we have two buildings. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you. Dad, you were describing the physical layout of the coroner's office. We have two buildings in the coroner's office. We have the 1102 building and the 1104 building. The 1104 building is the medical building, the lab building, and the autopsy area. It's got four floors, a basement, a service floor, a first floor, and a second floor. Doctor, where is the lunchroom uh, referred to in item seven located in the 1104 uh, medical facility? Uh, we have lunchroom in two of the floors, in the first floor and the second floor, and this refers to the first floor lunchroom. Doctor, what, on what floor are the autopsies performed? The service floor. In order to get to the service floor, how is one able to do that? It's a security floor. You need a key to get to the service floor, or one of the coroner's employees has to personally take you down there. You cannot go to the service floor without a key. And are keys handed out to persons other than employees of the coroner's office? No. Do all employees of the coroner's office have keys which allow access to the service floor? Only those employees who need access to the service floor. And they would include whom? The doctors, the technicians, the lab personnel, the investigators. Anything else about item 7? Uh, no. What about item 8? Uh, item 8 refers to... Uh, trying to have a response team from the coroner's office uh, on certain types of cases wherein you have a team of a pathologist, a criminalist, an investigator, uh, and transport person go to a scene. Uh, well, that is just uh, 
a situation which we do sometimes when we have the necessity to do it. Doctor, is this a wish list to yes. some degree? Yes. Do you have the resources to do that in every case that's recommended in item? Sustain, rephrase the question. Doctor, what resources would be required in order to do that recommendation in every case? You would need more. Oh, well. You would need more personnel in each division to. You would need more personnel in each area so that you have them available because, you know, in our office, many of the employees wear different hats. For example, our criminalist is also our toxicologist. A pathologist needs for autopsy, but he also has to go to court. So if you have more staff, you can have the luxury of sending people to every scene, but uh, it's not practical. And you already, I believe, have testified last week regarding whether, in your opinion, it would have made any significant difference on the uh, issue of the coroner visiting the Bundy location at the time the bodies were still there. Yes. Anything further about item eight? No. How about item nine? Item nine uh, refers to the coroner's office not having been allowed access to dissident by LAPD for 10 hours. We're going to discuss that, I believe, when we talk about time of death. Correct, doctor? Yes. All right, let's go to item uh, number 10. Uh, this refers to, uh, there was a request for valve procurement on Ms. Brown Simpson, and uh, that is a routine procedure in our office, wherein, as you know, organs for transplant is, uh, is obtained from, uh, uh, from different people if the family agrees to donate the organs, and usually the certain organs are removed from uh, individuals where such permission is obtained. And our office is uh, quite cooperative with all the organ procurement agencies as long as it doesn't interfere with our cause of death determination and uh, uh, injury interpretation. In this particular instance, this refers to uh, heart valve donation being allowed by the Simpson family. And when it was brought to my attention, I uh, denied it in the night and uh, in this particular case. And that's what this refers to. Why did you deny it, doctor? Uh, because uh, heart valve donation is an intrusive process because I would prefer that the DME is available to be there, the medical examiner who does the autopsy to be there when the valve is taken. And you know, any organ procurement has to be done in a particular time frame. You can't just uh, do it any time and use the valve. Uh, there was a time frame constraint here. The doctor assigned was Dr. Golden, because remember on June 13th, I assigned the cases to him. This request was brought to my attention in the night, in the evening of uh, June 13th. Uh, apparently, one of my assistant doctors had given permission, and but he asked the organ procurement agency to contact me, and I, at that time, told them no, because Dr. Golden was not the one who was going to be there. They had got another doctor there who was, uh, because as I told you, in our, in our office, we like a doctor to watch the procedure so that he knows exactly or she knows exactly what was being done because you open the chest, you take the valve, so you have to collect the blood sample properly. So there's a lot of procedures involved in this. So I made the uh, medical decision since Dr. Golden was not available in the night to go through this procedure and they had already got another doctor there and I felt in the best interest of the department that this procedure not be carried out and uh, that was my decision. Should I do one more or stop? Well, let's take a break here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our uh, recess for the morning session. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Do not discuss the case amongst yourselves or any opinions about the case. Conduct any deliberations until the matter has been submitted to you or allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. We'll stand in recess for 15 minutes. And Ms. Fett Fitzpatrick, can I talk to you, please? All right, back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter, all counsel and the defendant are again present, meaning Mr. Shapiro and Mr. Kelberg for these purposes. Very Mr. Briefly, Kelberg, you had something? Very briefly, I have informed Mr. Shapiro that Mr. Hernandez from the coroner's office called. He found no such memorandum from the district attorney's office concerning Dr. Golden. He did a record search, and then Dr. Lakshmanan told me that you had talked to, Dr., uh, to Mr. Hernandez yes. as well. And that was the same information he had received. 
Apparently, apparently, Mr. Shapiro had some information to the contrary that there was some some of these items in existence. The form, Mr. Shapiro was going to show me a form which I am familiar with that's in the EME manual that is a suggested form to be used. But as to any completed form, uh, specifically with reference to Dr. Golden, the information is as I've indicated for the record. Mr. Shapiro has something else. I'd be glad to. Uh, Go back and uh, search it out for Yes, we do, Your Honor. We would uh, ask the court to direct uh, Mr. Kelberg's attention to the case of George Wilson McGowan, M C G O W A N. The information that's been furnished to us is that there were direct orders issued by the judge in that case to the district attorney to notify the coroner directly about errors that had taken place and that resulted in a capital murder case being abruptly ended and the judge making a finding of factual innocence. If Mr. Shapiro has a coroner's case number, it would certainly... Yes, I do. Perhaps we can just pull that file, the file in its entirety. Dr. Lachman has that number also. Apparently he does. Okay, I'll give it to him. He reported it to uh, a reporter from the Los Angeles Times. Um, well, we need the coroner case number so we yeah, get the file. Get there, but, you know, right. We are inundated with a mass of documents. So the court was there with me for a moment. Yes. I'd like that to be available to the court, uh, hopefully before the noon hour, so council can have the opportunity to review the file. Because I suspect it may be fodder for uh, cross-examination. Yes, <clears throat> to call Mr. Hernandez and have the entire case file with that number brought to the paper and hopefully be working. All right, Mr. Uh, Kelberg, do you have all the other exhibits handy that you need to proceed with? No, I do, Your Honor. All right. I can't think of anything I can do without the witness. Well, is there another member of your staff who can make this phone call on his behalf? I think Dr. Lachman, I can give Mr. Lynch the phone number. And all right. Please. Since uh, prosecution has another hour and eight minutes. Well, Your Honor, I hope the court will Well, we spent a lot of time on relative minutia. Unfortunately, Your Honor, from my perspective, the minutia was raised long ago, and it's only at this point that we have an opportunity to show everyone it is minutia. 
Well, I just want to express to you my concern about undue consumption of time. I understand. I have one short area other than the one that we are discussing right now before I get into time with All right, Deputy Magnar, let's have the jurors, please. Yes, please. All right, let the record reflect. We've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. And Mr. Kelberg, you may conclude your direct examination. Dr. Carlo uh, can bring back exhibit 365. We're on page two. I believe we are on item 11. And does that refer to what we were discussing yesterday? And we also discussed it with respect to the Nicole Brown Simpson autopsy of the initial request for a H screen and your decision to order a C screen, toxicological screen, in each of those cases? Yes. Is there anything else to add to that? No. Item 12, did you discuss earlier in your testimony <coughs> regarding fluoroscopy as a form of x-ray? Yes. And have you discussed uh, what was or was not done in the form of x-ray? Yes, I have. And, Doctor, in your opinion, would fluoroscopy have been desirable in this case, as Mr. Sigler's letter indicates? No, I think in stab wound cases, x-rays are better because, if at all, there are going to be any fragments uh, of the knife. It's better seen on an x-ray than fluoroscopy. But sometimes fluoroscopy can help. But I would prefer to have an x-ray of an area because even if the fluoroscopy doesn't show it, sometimes you'll see it on the x-ray because fluoroscopy doesn't have the resolution, fine resolution of an x-ray. Doctor, did you also testify, however, that no x-rays were taken, for example, of the skulls of either victim? That's correct. And we asked you questions about whether, in your opinion, there was any indication that the blade of the knife had broken off in the course of any of the infliction of the sharp force injuries. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. In your opinion, is there any evidence to indicate that that had occurred? No. Objection, Your Honor. Obviously, if they didn't do the test, they couldn't find evidence. Your Honor. That was a speaking objection, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Doctor, anything further about item 12? Uh, item 12, no. Item 13, what does that refer to? Oh, that refers to in the week following the autopsy, there was a request for photographs uh, from our office because there's a grand jury hearing on the case. And our machine uh, was not functioning. You know, after the earthquake, we had some problems with our printer and processor, and now we have a new photographic uh, equipment available. And uh, basically, uh, we requested, uh, I requested uh, LAPD uh, to cooperate and make the prints for us, so we made a one print set for us and one print set for uh, uh, the grand jury hearings. And what Mr. Siegler is referring to is uh, he feels that the prints could have been made by sheriff than LAPD. So it's just a matter of which agency you choose. And to me, it doesn't make any difference because LAPD was nearby. They were handling the case on these two dissidents, and I requested LAPD. 
about the next item? What does that refer to? Oh, 14 photographic prints could have been um, been available to the assigned pathologist prior to review of the medical protocol. This is a procedure which uh, is uh, which is being at least done on some of the cases, wherein the pathologist looks at the photographs before the protocol is signed to see for any uh, problems we uh, may have uh, with reference to injuries not being described or also to see whether the injuries which have been described are correct. And is there some delay in the normal course of your business uh, about getting the photograph with respect to your requirement to have the protocol dictated within 24 hours of the completion of the autopsy? Uh, that, that is uh, correct. Uh, but right now, we have the new equipment. We just came following the earthquake. We got a new piece of equipment wherein you can have contact prints available one hour after the photography is done. So what I'm trying to do at the current time is to have some contact prints available to the doctors before they even do the autopsy to make sure that all the injuries are uh, photographed. And this, again, is a, a laborious procedure. And there are, we're trying to do it, but it's not been very successful. But that's the goal. What is a contact print, just so we we'll understand? Contact prints, the print is the same size as the negative. So you have one strip with all the photographs taken on the case. So the doctor knows which areas have been photographed. This is something new we are trying to do in our office. How about the next item, item 15? Oh, that refers to the uh, to have bottles made, depending on uh, what kind of case you're dealing with, reference to toxicology samples. If you have a suspected suicide, uh, you make all the specimens available. Uh, I mean, the containers available for a full tox collection. Uh, because you like to have liver samples, uh, stomach contents, uh, bile, urine, so that you can correlate the blood levels with the tissue levels and support your diagnosis or don't support your diagnosis of suicide. Uh, Is there anything about this observation by Mr. Sigler that affects uh, your ability to evaluate the evidence in these two autopsy cases? No. Uh, I think the decision on what specimens to collect is the is the decision of the medical examiner. It's a medical decision. You have to use it uh, intelligently to decide what you'd want to done in a particular case. So this would apply because we do have residents coming into our office uh, who work under supervision. And this is something which is already in place. We do a full talks on certain types of cases. And certain type of cases, we just collect blood. Like in traffic accidents, I already mentioned, we collect blood and urine, <coughs> depending on the nature of the case. Next item, item 16. That is just a, a statement. Uh, one of the diagrams was uh, not uh, available at the time of initial re release of documents, and it was released to, to the defense team when I met them on June 22nd. It was one diagram form which was uh, misplaced and later uh, retrieved and uh, presented to all parties concerned. Dr. was this a type of diagram such as we've been using in the course of the discussion of these two autopsies? Yes. Anything else about item 16? No. Mr. Farrell, can you show us the rest of that page, please?
I can see. <coughs> Doctor, can you identify, obviously we know who the middle name is, the first and third names for the copies? Mr. Hernandez is the director of the department. He's in charge of all non-physician operations. Mr. Scott Carey is the public information officer. And Mr. Farrell, we'll put on a single page that is the last part of this exhibit, 365. <clears throat> Doctor, in general terms, what is this document? This is the notes uh, taken by Gary Siegler during the medical examiner's meeting on June 23rd, 94. And these notes were used by him to generate that letter which we just discussed. So these handwritten entries then relate to what is later included in the listed 16 items in the letter to Mr. Hodgman? That's correct. I don't think we, uh, it, it, I'll leave it up to the court if the court wishes the ladies and gentlemen of the jury to have an opportunity to read it. Let's give them an opportunity to at least get a flavor for what it is. Albert. If I could inquire just briefly while we're um, showing this portion. Doctor, item seven, incidentally, just initially, uh, this appears to be a shorthanded version of the items. For example, looking at item two, appears Mr. Sigler has handwritten looky loos, and in the type document, item two is preventing uninvolved employees from observing decedents should have occurred. Is this, again, to be a shorthanded method of note taking? Yes. Now, looking at item seven, the late call out, liver temp slash sexual assault. I mean nine, item nine? Oh, I'm sorry. You're correct, item nine. And perhaps Mr. Farrell could raise that. We're going to talk about, as part of time of death, uh, this issue of when your office was notified, when Ms. Radcliffe went, and so forth. With respect to the sexual assault entry here, doctor, what, if anything, different than what we discussed with you on the appropriateness or inappropriateness of taking a sexual assault kit in this case of Nicole Brown Simpson is referred to by that entry. Nothing further to add. Your Honor, do you wish to give the juries? Uh, no, I think we've seen this now. All right. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. I have one other area of inquiry before talking to you, Doctor, about time of death. And we raised it earlier dealing with Claudine Radcliffe, your investigator, who went to the Bundy location. And it concerns the issue of taking blood uh, samples of some form from a back of Nicole Brown Simpson. Do you recall that general area? Yes. And you testified, I believe already, even today, that when the body arrived at the coroner's office on the 13th of June, you asked Mr. Mahaney, one of your criminalists, to take blood samples from two areas of Nicole Brown Simpson's body as reflected on the appropriate uh, evidence log. Is that correct? Uh, he took blood samples from two areas. And that's reflected in the appropriate evidence log, correct? Yes. Now I want to um, talk to you very briefly, and put it in the location where we use the uh, photographs. And Dr. again, with the court's permission, would you step down? This is Exhibit uh, 354, Your Honor. Doctor, first of all, do you see the area where you asked Mr. Mahaney to take samples from when you saw the body at your offices 
on June 13th. Yeah, he made the determination which areas to take. I think he took the right thigh and calf area, these blood samples. All right, referring to photograph CS11 and the area of the right leg where you're pointing and down further below the knee. Is that correct? Yes. I want to invite your attention both to the back of Nicole Brown Simpson as seen in CS11 and the back of Nicole Brown Simpson as seen in CS12. Uh, do you see what appears to you to be blood on the back of her body? Yes. Would you have expected Claudine Ratcliffe to have taken any action at the scene to have that blood collected? Uh, if she had seen it and she felt it was uh, important, she would have asked it to be collected. Doctor, would you have Motion to strike, non-responsive. Oh, well. Doctor, would you have considered it significant in any way uh, that such that you would have expected her to have had action taken to obtain those samples? Uh, if, uh, if it had been seen, I think it should have been taken. Why? Because you don't have any injury in that area, and you have blood drops there, uh, and this could be uh, blood drops falling off a weapon uh, which could reflect the blood of the dissident, could be the blood of the, uh, if in this case we have a second victim, it could have also reflected if the uh, perpetrator had some injury, which can happen sometimes, and the perpetrator's blood. So it could be, it's good to collect and see whose blood it is. Does the failure, and there was no effort made by Ms. Radcliffe to have that collected as far as you understand, is that correct? It was not collected as for all the evidence logs we showed. Doctor, is the failure to have that collected a matter which causes you to be unable to determine the issues you have been talking about for the last week or so? Objection, vague. Sustained. Doctor, is the absence of that evidence such that you cannot form opinions as a forensic pathologist with respect to the cause of death? Uh, it's nothing to do with the cause of death. Is there anything about the absence of that evidence which prevents you as a forensic pathologist from determining whether a single-edged knife caused each and every one of the, of the sharp force injuries you identified in the course of your review? This evidence has no bearing on that conclusion. Doctor, is there any significance without that evidence to your ability as a forensic pathologist to determine how long it would take to cause all of these injuries on these two people? Again, this evidence will not have any bearing to those conclusions or opinions I rendered. Doctor, is the absence of that evidence of any significance to you as a forensic pathologist in ascertaining whether one person armed with a single-edged knife of approximately six-inch length tapering at the tip could have killed both of these human beings? Again, uh, this evidence uh, collection would not uh, have uh, had any effect on my opinions on those hypothetical, I mean, those issues which you brought up. In your opinion, could the evidence have, if taken, have been helpful to you, even if it does not uh, prevent you from answering the questions I've asked? If it had been collected, it will be one more piece of information which is available. If it's the blood of Ms. Uh, Simpson, then it will reflect that the blood drops are, are hers and falling off the weapon. And that would also support my opinion that the uh, perpetrator was in the back, from the back lifted the head while she was face down and cut her neck. And if, for example, it was blood that was tested and found to genetically match blood drops found along the walkway leading to the back of the property and which further matched genetically to that of Mr. Simpson, the defendant, would that have been helpful to you also in evaluating one, whether one perpetrator could have killed both of these two human beings in a brief, swift, and violent attack? It would suggest uh, if that blood sample matched the perpetrator, uh, and it would suggest that at least one perpetrator was involved with this, uh, with this evidence. Is there anything further about that issue, Doctor? No. Doctor, in the 
investigator's manual, which you talked about uh, on sexual assault kits, and inviting counsel to page 6.0.1. Under field evidence procedures, is this what your investigators are instructed to do? Excuse me, just a second, Mr. Shapiro. Do you have that available? I can walk over and show it. It might be. <coughs> All right. Thank you, Judge. Appreciate it. Again, doctor, uh, referring to page 6.0.1, is this part of what your investigators, such as Ms. Radcliffe, are instructed uh, to do at scenes like uh, the Bundy location? Under field evidence procedures, it is recognized that each death scene is unique and that the proper procedures for examining the decedent for evidence and the order of implementation of those procedures are dependent upon the circumstances of a particular case. Coroner's personnel conducting an investigation at the scene of a death shall communicate and cooperate with investigative personnel from the investigating police agency to determine the best manner in which to proceed. Is that part of what they are instructed to do? Yes. And one other. Manual. Doctor, is there something called an Operations Bureau Manual? Yes, that is the uh, manual which is used by the Investigations Division of our office, their procedures. Thank you, Your Honor. And 